So I know that Toward the Goal Ministries has a lot to say this morning, and I want to honor that time. I, I'm going to keep my introduction fairly short. However, I believe, how many know who Toward the Goal Ministries have heard of Toward the Goal Ministries? Look at that, guys. You're not strangers here. How many like, okay, I was going to say how many. I won't do that. Toward the Gold Ministries is based out of Sugar Creek. Bruce and Jocelyn Hampshire founded that a number of years ago. What they do is coaching for businesses, for your personal life, um, all, all sorts of things that they do. Um, the one that stands out to us here at Light in the Valley the most right now is the premarital counseling that is done by Andy and his wife Amy. And so if you don't know who Andy is, uh, Andy would be the son of Ben Raber, who sometimes brings the word here at Light in the Valley. So that's who Andy is. Now, Emily, I know that her husband is Neil Hosteller. Outside of that, I don't know that much about them. And then Kristen, this is the first time I've met you. So you know that I trust Andy and Emily if I'm giving you the mic here on this stage, right? Uh, but in true Light in the Valley fashion, would you guys give a big round welcome for these guys? Emily's going to be bringing uh, some things from Toward the Goal. They're going to explain what Toward the Goal Ministries actually does. And then Andy will close uh, with a message for us this morning. Thank you so much. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, like Jimmy said, my name is Emily, and I work at Toward the Goal Ministries. Um, I just want to start off by sharing our mission and our vision. So our mission at Toward the Goal is to serve and empower by intentionally investing in the lives of people through coaching, mentoring, and servant leadership development. Our vision is to become a place where Christ is experienced. We want to be a place of hope, of encouragement, and ongoing transformation. So when Andy asked me to come up and give a few minutes of highlighting what I do, um, I thought of one area of ministry that we do that best enca encapsulates um, how we live out our vision. So. For the last six years, we have had the opportunity to be a part of the lives of the girls at the local group home in New Philly. Um, when we first started there, we started off by offering mentoring to girls who um, live at the house, and so that involves us spending time with them once a week. Um, the amount of time varies just because of the situations and circumstances. We don't actually know how long we'll get to be with the girls. And then off of that, we also have spent the last six years going in every Tuesday uh, evening and we come in and we bring an activity with the girls. We often bring a lot of snacks because we know if we bring snacks they'll usually engage. And so um, so whether it's bringing a character uh, skill based on the Bible or whether it's bringing a life skill, we'll spend a few hours with them just getting to know them. And in the last few years we've also had the opportunity to come in uh, one Wednesday a month and sit around the table and have supper with them. And so the heart behind this was we just wanted to be able to do life with them in a way that was not, was not as structured. So once a month, we'll come in and bring in a meal with them, whether it's homemade or pizza, and we will just sit and eat with them and listen to them talk about their day. Um, and not only did it, does it give us an opportunity to get to know them, but it also gave uh, the girls and the staff as well um, a free night to not cook or do dishes. So um, like I said, I wanted to share with you guys uh, how our vision is best played out in the way that we do ministry. And so I am gonna share a mentoring story from the group home. This is Jackson and Gina's story and they gave me permission to share it. So can you put up that first set of pictures? Thank you. So this is Jackson. We met Jackson in January of 2020 when she first came to the group home. Um, the best way I can describe Jackson in a few words at that time was she was dark, she was cold, and she was very guarded. Um, and, and very understandably so given the story that she came from. Um, she had little desire to want to do anything with Jesus. Um, anytime we would come, she would pretty much sit in the corner of a couch and just watch us. And so we matched her with Gina, one of our fabulous mentors, and she took hold of the opportunity to walk with Jackson. She got to spend 18 months with her, or excuse me, 20 months with her, walking with her and doing life with her. Nothing fancy. She'd pick Jackson up sometimes and they'd go hiking. Um, they, sometimes she'd pick her up a Starbucks drink and they'd sit and talk. Sometimes they'd stay at the house. Sometimes they'd go to Gina's house. And so the picture on the right there with her pink hair, this was just a few months before Jackson left the group home. And like I said, she had no interest in the gospel or who Jesus was or who Jesus thought of her. But because of the trust that Gina had built over time, um, in that picture, um, Jackson came to Gina one day and said, 
what do you think that God says of me? How do you think he views me? And so that led to multiple conversations, multiple opportunities for Gina to share scripture with her and to share who God says she is. And so there was one time that Gina came to her uh, and said, hey, I have this specific scripture that God gave to me um, in prayer for you, and I want to share it with you. And Jackson was so deeply impacted, it brought her to tears. And so anyways, Jackson left the group home. She ended up moving away, and they continued to stay in touch. Um, and when Jackson moved back to the area, uh, they were able to pick up their relationship like nothing had um, changed. And so it's really cool. Can you do the next pictures, please? Okay, so this is Jackson today. So um, this is why we do what we do at Toward the Goal. We want to see transformational work happen. Okay, We have no um, power or authority to do heart work, but this is a tangible example of transformational work like it says in Romans 12 too. So Jackson, when we first met her, like I said in 2020, was cold, dark, and very guarded. She had a lot of confusion about who she was, uh, was very insecure. So because of Gina's consistency and um, willingness to show unconditional love, this is Jackson today. She just had a baby a few months ago, um, and she's very open to who Jesus says that she is. We'll often ask questions to Gina, and it's really cool because about six months before she had this baby, Jackson and her boyfriend would consistently ask Gina to pick them up and take them to church. So I share this story, you guys, because sometimes transformational work, at least to me, can seem like it's something that has to be immediate. But if I've learned anything, good things, good lasting things take time. And Jackson's story is proof of that. So thank you. Good morning. My name's Kristen. I work at Toward the Goal. I'm an administrative assistant, and so I do a lot of things. But one of the hats that I wear that I love the most is being a mentor coordinator. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Toward the Goal mentoring. Um, it began in 2017, and since then we've only seen the need for mentors increase. Um, and in healthy homes too. Um, I think everybody knows this world like just keeps changing and things keep get hard, getting harder for every kid um, and for every person. So we've seen the need grow from mentoring in youth to also adults, which has been really cool. The goal of Toward the Goal Mentoring is to provide one more trusted adult in each of these people's lives. Um, and we do that through one-on-one -on -one relationship. Uh, recently, I heard somebody say, uh, the most, attention is the most basic form of love. And that actually like grabbed me. I couldn't shake it. It um, is like the heart of mentoring. Like how, many, how much it means to just like sit with another person and be there completely to like get to know them and what they're walking through. So I brought a video today of one of our mentors. His name is Greg. And I'm going to let him tell a little bit of his story. Um, so... You can watch this. Hi, I'm Greg Beach, and I am a mentor with Toward the Goal Ministries. Uh, the greatest lesson I think I've learned through my three years of mentoring is that God can do more uh, with an open and a willing heart than I can do in any amount of trying. Because goodness knows, I tried and I tried when I first started. I was always doing my best to create an experience or making sure that I, I had enough texts and making sure that I was planning uh, the next event. And I just felt like I tried so hard, putting so much stress on myself. And uh, the staff at Toward the Goal Ministries just kept reminding me, Greg, I'm sure you're doing a great job. Don't worry, you're doing great. So. I took that to heart, but I wanted to believe it so much, but it was hard to believe, you know, that that little bit of time that I was investing could truly make a difference in somebody's life. Because I am a father of four children, I've got a wife, I've got a business that I own, and I'm responsible for so many things. And I just thought there's no way I have enough time to do this. Over the years, I've learned to relax a little bit and just start to do life with my mentee and had him in my home and we did fewer things that were planned and scheduled and we just started doing life together. I don't know, when, when I first saw him, he would hardly look me in the eyes and those first few moments, the first few meetings we had together were uncomfortable and awkward, but over time, he just started to open up and relaxed and 
Then three years later, uh, he graduates um, from high school with honors, and he's going to college this year. That's something God did, it's not me. Because I tried and it didn't work. <laughs> well, he was doing it anyway. But um, as time went on now, uh, just recently, we were together, we were in our home, and he said, I love being at your home. It's so nice, it's so welcoming. I feel so much love here. And he said, someday I want my home to be just like this. Couldn't have said something better. Well, if you've ever experienced a difficult situation in your life, then you've probably had somebody come alongside you and said, hey, it's gonna be all right. Put their arm around you, maybe take you out for coffee. Whatever they might have done, they've, they've given you a new perspective, a new hope. And I think if you've had that experience, then you've been mentored. Whether or not it was formal or official, you've been mentored. So if you've had somebody do that for you, you can do it for others. It's not complicated. If anybody tells you it's complicated, they're trying too hard. So I would just say, don't make it too difficult. Just try and live life with your mentee and you can do it. So that's Greg. I absolutely love their story. Um, we actually got a video of the student that he mentored to and for sake of time, you can check it out on any of our social media. We had posted it back in November, but it's so cool to hear him tell his story of losing his father and then the role that Greg came in and played just by spending time with him. Um, so we are currently providing mentors at Garraway, Highland, West Homes, and like Emily said, at the group home. We've also exported the model that we use to other schools and churches outside of our community. Uh, and it's just been really cool to see this grow. Like I had said, in youth and also in adults, adult relationships. Um, so if there would be any interest in like getting a student involved, you can see any of us. Um, you can talk to your guidance counselor, um, the administration at your school. They are so involved, which has been really cool for us too, we've just been like brought in so well. Um, if you have a heart for mentoring, like watching Greg's story, and it's like, I think I could do that. Uh, we can use you. We can use um, lots of mentors. The need just keeps growing. Uh, there's other opportunities to support to toward the goal of mentoring. We use any of the funding that comes in to help pay for, we do mentor trainings. We do background checks on all our mentoring. Uh, on our mentors. We provide resources for the mentors, and then we also do some funding for uh, activities that promote these mentoring relationships. Also, I would just ask that you pray over the group home, all these mentoring relationships. We have over 60 relationships in our community, and that's an amazing thing. So just prayer for these relationships to provide growth and encouragement. So thank you. Wonderful. Well, my name is Andy. I get to be a part of this crew yet. And in the, in the toward the goal piece that I get to play a part of is uh, business relationships, uh, business coaching, roundtables, one-on-ones, doing some one-on-ones with adults, um, just mentoring, sitting with them, doing life with them. And then I look around the room and yeah, we've I know a few of you from premarital, and Amy and I get the honor of just bringing young adults into our home, sit at our table, eat our food, and we just go through, you know, what's life going to look like after marriage? We definitely don't have it all figured out. They know that, but it's like if we can equip you and prepare you a little bit for what you're going to experience, hopefully you can pick up some more along the way. So, um, Bruce calls us at times a Swiss army knife. And, and I hope you've heard that this morning just about toward the goal, that it's, it's the group home, it's mentoring, it's high school mentoring, it's adult mentoring, it's business coaching. Uh, there's just, there's a wide variety of things that we kind of all work in our strengths and we get to go out into the marketplace, into the world, and just impact the lives we come in contact with. Here's the really, really neat part, is that the entire thing is donation-based. As a, as a ministry, we are funded through donations. 
And God has provided over and over and over. Uh, it just, it is, it has been so cool. I, I can speak to premaritals. There's a handful of business owners that say, hey, we think strong marriages are key. I would agree with that. And it's just like simply, would you donate to make a space to pay us so that we can make a space in our home? And they do over and over and over. And what that means is that a young couple doesn't have to come in and spend a bunch of money. We ask them to spend $35, take an assessment, and that's what we go through. And so just, we're, we're donation-based, we're funded that way. If you have any interest in mentoring, being a part of it, reach out. We'd love to talk to you and just engage you with more. So, so this morning, I think Jimmy has left now, so we can talk about whatever we want, right? This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 1. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, if you, wanna, if you want a story of how, how TTG, how Toward the Goal works, about three years ago, Bruce was at, I was, in a, I was part of a leadership group, and, and he was speaking. I didn't really know Bruce that well, knew of toward the goal, but didn't know him well. And he said something, and he said, always be ready to preach, pray, or die. And it was like, okay. And so out of preach, pray, or die, he made us put a little, like, 15-minute sermonette together. And he said, now you got one. Stick it in your pocket and use it. And from that time, this text is what was born out of that. It's been tweaked, it's been added to, it's been changed. But at the core, it goes back to Bruce and just his encouragement to be a part of this leads class and go for it. So as we get ready, it will be Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Let me pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning, uh, this time together to share in your word. We just pray that you would calm our hearts, calm our minds, open us up to what you have for us this morning that it wouldn't be my voice, but Holy Spirit, that it would be your voice that resonates through us, that as, as we leave here today, that we would be changed by what we hear from you. It's your name we pray, amen. So as I meet with people and as I meet with uh, couples and, and just groups, I, I hear the same thing a lot. Man, we're busy. Right, and, and it begs this question in my mind, are we being driven or are we driving? Usually when I ask that, most people will land in this area of, I feel like I am being driven, right? I am being shoved down the road of life. I'm on a raft in the rapids, and I am just trying to keep it upright. There may be places where you feel in control, but for the most part, it's just this one big thing going down the river, and if we stay upright and don't drown, we have succeeded. The flip side of that is driving, learning boundaries, checking our pace, knowing where we are going, and making decisions on what we say yes to and how we get there. It puts us back in control. It feels like we now have direction for our life, and we're not just being washed along in the current. So this morning in Mark chapter 1, we get to, we get to see about a 36-hour window in Jesus' life. And it's this, it's this really, really neat story that we're going to unpack. Just He's going to have a, a day. It's, it's the Sabbath and what is happening on this day and then the response that Jesus has. What he does after he has this really, really full day. And so the story that, as I was getting this ready, that comes to mind is I was about 10 years old and spent most of the summers on the farm either either of dad's sisters. There were two farms. But this one in particular, we were making hay. And, and if you've made hay and, and baled the field, you start on the outside and you start collecting these bales. And as we, as we made the rounds around the field, we got to the center and the turns got sharper and sharper. And it was my job to drive the team. And when you get to the last few rows of bales to pick up, the, the wagon is loaded with hay you begin to swing, and, and the horses are actually out almost underneath the wagon. 
and there's this two-horse spreader that's behind it. And we, and we make this turn that's sharper and sharper. And all of a sudden, we're here, and we're making this turn when that two-horse spreader behind the horses snaps. Now, it doesn't matter how calm of a team of horses you have, when something snaps behind them, they leave. The wagon stays, they leave. Now, I'm a 10-year-old hanging onto the reins, and there are braided leather lines running through my hands and blistering my hands. And I think if we're being honest, that's a picture of where a lot of us land this morning. That rather than making a little bit bigger turn, rather than slowing our pace, knowing where we're going, rather than swooping a little bit wider, we just turn a little bit sharper and a little bit sharper until all of a sudden that snap happens. And it just, it hurts and it feels like it's completely out of control now and I can't stop it. So this morning in Mark chapter 1, we find Jesus, and it says they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. So just real quick, so Jesus goes in, it's, it's a Sabbath, so it's Saturday, he goes in and he's teaching, and he's teaching as one who has authority, right? This means that he's not referring back to, oh, like so-and-so interpreted it this way, and so-and-so, he's saying, like, no, this is what the scripture says, because he has the authority to do that, right? Being fully God, he can say, this is what it means. And so he gets people's attention, and immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, crying out with a loud voice, came out. And they were all amazed. And so they questioned among themselves, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all Galilee and the surrounding region. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So he's got this really busy day. He's, he's now he's taught He's cast out a demon, he's got everyone's attention, and he leaves the synagogue and he enters the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told her, told him about her. And he came and he took her by the hand, he lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. If you've not watched The Chosen, this is a really cool scene where Jesus just comes in and he heals Peter's mother-in-law, and, and she's better at once. And she just gets up and she starts cleaning and like nothing ever happened. This is also a picture. If, if you hear nothing else this morning, this is a perfect picture of the gospel. When Jesus comes into our life, reaches down and touches us, he doesn't get dirty. In, in this culture, if you touched a sick person, you had to go be cleansed, right? The Pharisees had figured out social distancing and contact tracing well before we did. Jesus comes in contact with a sick person and doesn't become unclean. Rather, he heals. And that is the gospel in people's lives. That is the gospel in my life. He has reached down, has cleansed me, and forgiven all of it completely clean. So if you hear nothing else, at least hear that. That's what Jesus will do. And then he goes on and says, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he did not permit them to speak. So here's what we have, right? He's teaching, he casts out a demon, he goes to Peter's mother-in-law, he heals her. He's got the, the whole town. It says the whole town came out. When sundown happens, the Sabbath ends. 
right? So in, in the culture here, like sunrise to, or I'm sorry, sunset to sunset, when the sunset happens on the Sabbath, we can now go and work, right? We can now go and do things again is the culture here. And so when that happens, the ruckus he had made, right, the attention that he had gained, the whole town came out and was knocking on the door. Now just think about that. He, he was teaching through, he traveled to Peter's mother-in-law, which would have just been down the road, and now the whole town is at the door. I think like sometimes like that's, our life feels like the whole town is at the door. And it says he healed many, and he cast out demons and didn't allow them to speak. I want to define something a little bit here. There's a difference between a prescriptive and a descriptive text. Right? A, a prescriptive text is a, a text that tells us something very explicitly do or do not do. Right? A descriptive text is describing something that happened and then we can learn from it. Right? So in this case, we're going to be looking at a descriptive text. Another descriptive text would be David and Goliath. Right? If I encounter a giant of a man who is cursing my God, I don't have permission to kill him with a slingshot. Right? That's not prescriptive. If I had permission to kill him with a slingshot, that'd be prescriptive. This is descriptive. And so what we're going to look at is what is Jesus' response to this day? Right? It's, it's really full. And if you are here today as a follower of Jesus, you have become a disciple of his. And a disciple looks at his teacher and says, I want to do the things that he does. Right? We also read that Jesus wore sandals. I don't need to wear sandals. You're welcome to. I don't need to. Paul, in Ephesians 5, says, Therefore, be imitators of God. Be a reflection of God. 1 Corinthians, Paul says again, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians, he says, and you become imitators of us and of the Lord. Right? Imitate the Lord. Look like Jesus. We don't become Jesus, but we can look like him. And so we see this really full day that he has, and we're going to look at what his response is. And it says in verse 35, and Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place, and there he prayed. It's interesting to me that Jesus, being fully God and fully man at the same time, departs and he goes and he prays. Like, why does Jesus need to pray? Because he wants to be in communication with God his father, right? He, he wants to be in unison and communication and know the heart of the father. Amy and I can be married and never talk. Are we married? Yes. Do we have a great relationship? No. But when I become curious of the heart of Amy, what makes her tick? What is it that she enjoys doing? What are the things that she finds joy in? What are the things that are burdensome or heavy or she doesn't like or upset her. When I become curious of those things, I begin to ask questions, right? And that's what we see Jesus do in communication with the Father. It is building his relationship. And so for me and for Amy, when we look and we spend time together and we communicate, our marriage grows and it blooms and it fosters something wonderful, a beautiful relationship that we get to spend the rest of our life together Figuring it out as we go. And so here's what we see Jesus do. He has this really full day, right? It's just, it's over the top, packed in one thing to the next. We can read that, we can see that. And at some point, they would have said, okay guys, that's enough, right? Everyone's at the door, that's enough. We gotta get some sleep. It doesn't say in the text that they went to bed, but we'll see here in a minute that he got away and they didn't realize that he left. And so very early in the morning, it says that Jesus woke up and he went out while it was still dark. And just, I, I pictured, right, the room full of people and disciples, just everyone kind of found a corner to lay down, sit in. 
And can you imagine Jesus just like walking out, stepping over people? Like he's getting away because he knows that he needs to slow his pace. He knows he needs to go and be in communication with the Father. And that's what Jesus offers for us today. And when it says that he went to a desolate place, he didn't just go to the back porch for coffee. Right? A desolate place is the same word that is used when it describes the temptation of Jesus in the desert. Right? Like it is, he got away. Right? He, he's gone. He's out of the building and in a desolate place. Let me ask you this. Do you feel like you have time in your life today to actually go spend time with the Father? Is, is the hurry in your life so loud that I don't even have time to go to the back porch, let alone get away to go spend time with the Father? It is absolutely one of my favorite passages, and, and it's Matthew 11, and it's, this, is, this is the message translation version of it. And he talks about, the, the, here's what it says, are you tired? These are the words of Jesus. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The invitation from Jesus is, man, if you feel burdened by life, if you feel burdened by religion, come. There's freedom. You've been forgiven, right? You, you now walk freely. As I was thinking of pace and putting all this together, I came across a burnout questionnaire. And, and it just asked 20, no, it was more than that, 40 questions, 40 statements. And it, and it wanted you to answer them anything from often, always, to seldom or never. And I just, I picked a few of them out to help help us check our pace? Do we feel like we have time to slow down and be with the Father? So here's the first one. It says, do you feel tired and fatigued rather than energetic even when you get enough sleep? Always, sometimes, or never. Do you feel overwhelmed? Are you too busy for ordinary things like phone calls, reading, calling or contacting family and friends? Does your life entail so many different tasks that you feel fragmented? Always, sometimes, or never. And so the question becomes, what, what is pushing our pace? What, what is it that has crowded into our life that is pushing our pace to go faster and faster and faster? That we can't actually take time to live freely in Christ. Henry Nouwen talks about the conditional love of the world. God's love is unconditional. There, there is no condition that you need to meet to be loved by God. If you are in Christ, you are loved, and it's unconditional. There's just continuous forgiveness there over and over. We aren't going to get it right. We are still humans in fleshy bodies. We aren't going to get it right all the time. But Henry Nouwen says that the world's love is conditional. And here's what that means. The world says it will love you if, right, there's a condition. The world will love you if you look good enough, if you make enough money, if you're smart enough, if you have a title at work, if you get a degree, if you start varsity, if you're on the starting team, if you stop sinning, if you're productive and efficient. 
that last one is interesting because in a, in a culture that we live in today, right, our, the context, a lot of times we get described as this place that has really good work ethic. And what a wonderful way to describe a people, right? People who are willing to get up and go to work. Awesome. But do you see how the pursuit of that, if somebody comes to you, if, you're, if your employer comes to you and says, I really enjoy what you do, you do it really well, and here's an extra $5. What does it spur in me? I want to do more. And I will do more and more and more. If I work a little bit harder and I work a little bit faster, I'll make more money. Do you see how the feedback loop becomes repetitive and the bookends of my sleep are going to move towards each other. The time that I go to bed and the time that I wake up are going to slowly begin to creep towards each other. There was a gentleman that I met with, and he talked about he would go out on the crew and he would work and he would absolutely kill himself. He'd come home, he'd do billing, and then he'd go eat dinner with the kids and he'd uh, spend 30 minutes, four, maybe an hour, 45 minutes, and then it would be back to his office, and he would work on quotes well into the night. It was about 11 o'clock. And about 2.30 in the morning, he had to get up because he had to go pick up material for the next day because he told the guys that he would do this. And about, about three hours of sleep, after a couple weeks, months of that, the chest pains creep in. Right? It becomes really burdensome. But here's the feedback loop. Right? The world says, I'll love you if... You make enough money, you, you're efficient, you do enough. And so we begin to pursue that. And it increases our pace. It makes us go faster and faster. You can't go all the way to zero with sleep. Rest is a really good thing, I've heard. And that's the beautiful thing, that Jesus wants you to come as you are where he found you. Amy and I were talking about this passage and so we were talking about pace and slowing down and getting up and her question was, well, so does that mean I have to get up early in the morning? No, right? Descriptive text. We see Jesus do this. We see Jesus in response to his day get up and go be with the Father. Right? He didn't get up and go binge watch Netflix to get away. Right? He got up to quiet his mind, to be with the Father, and pray. You'll see this in, in Mark, I think it's Mark chapter 6, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. He puts his disciples on a boat, he kicks them off the shore, he takes care of the rest of the crowd, dismissing them, getting rid of them, and then he gets away. He gets away in the evening after a busy day of feeding the 5,000. He gets away, he slows his pace, and he spends time with the Father. That's where then he walks on the water out to the disciples during the night. So it's not necessarily just in the morning. The key here is that he slows his pace. He knows what he is doing when he has a really full day to get away. The next thing that we see Jesus do after he is praying, it says that Simon and those that were with him searched for him. Right, so, so he snuck out of the house, he, he gets away, he sneaks out of the house, he's praying with the Father, and they go looking for him. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you! Like seriously, we just had the whole, so the Gospel of Mark, good chance, is written through the eyes of Peter. Right? And if you've studied Peter a little bit, Peter is a little excitable. Right? He's, he's the, the guy that's going to jump out of the boat when he sees Jesus on the shore. Like, he's a little excitable. And so there's a good chance that that was Peter's words. Right? Everyone is looking for you. The, the paragraph before said that the, all the town, the whole town was at the door. But he healed many. Not all, he healed many. So there were still people who would have been at the door waiting for the next morning, like, okay, now it's time, right? Like, turn on the healing machine. We're going to filter through the door. 
And here's the response of Jesus. He said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. We see Jesus articulate his why. Jesus, as a Messiah, heals people, casts out demons to show the compassion in his heart for people. But the why of Jesus is that he could spread the good news of the coming Messiah, that he was here. He says, let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. It doesn't say it in the text. I would say that there was probably someone that was disappointed in that town. There was probably somebody back at the door of Peter's mother-in-law's house that was probably disappointed. They brought all the people out and they're standing there waiting and it's like, hey, did you see this? Did you see what this guy did last night? Go get mom. Go get our neighbor and let's go back. And then somebody comes over the hill, comes back to the house and it's like, no, he's not coming back. He's going to the next town. You want to know why a great crowd followed Jesus? Because he taught with authority. He loved people and he healed them and they followed him. Today we get to follow him and we get to look at his life and become a reflection of that. Could you today articulate your why? Why do you do the things that you do? Jesus has his why and it gives him a really good boundary. It's going to disappoint a few people. But when you know why you do the things that you do, it gives you permission to say no to the rest. Now, that is going to fight the people pleaser in all of us. I have ever met two people that told me they were not people pleasers. One of them, 30 minutes into the conversation, was telling me how he couldn't quit his job because it would let down his leaders. Tell me you're not a people pleaser. It's also fun to say yes to things. When somebody asks you to help out, when somebody says, hey, could you help me move? Could you help me with this project? Could you do this for me? It's fun to say yes. We're meeting a need. We're meeting somebody's need. That's enjoyable. The problem is, I'm afraid it goes without boundaries. It goes without guardrails. We just say yes to everything, and then we look back at our pace, and we wonder why we're stressed out. Because now, I'm working as much as I can. I'm volunteering everywhere that I am asked to volunteer, and I'm doing all the things that I think I should be doing, and I don't actually have time with the Father. Shoot, I don't even have time with my kids the way I want. I don't have time for my marriage the way that I want. And so when we begin to look at our why, why do we do the things that we do? And you can begin to look at the things that energize you, the things that excite you. What are the the situations that you put yourself in throughout the last, think of two, three years? Where do you put yourself in And that when you walk out, it's like, man, if I could do that again, that would be fun. There's a good chance out of your natural talents and spiritual giftings, that has something to do with your why. And then look for places that you can apply yourself. And here's what it'll do. It'll give you permission to say no to the rest. Somebody comes to me and says, hey, I need you to and they start talking about sit in a corner with a spreadsheet and count something and don't ever interact with a human, good chance I'm out. I love me some spreadsheets, but I also love me some people, right? And it's like, that's why I get to do what I do. I get to be with people. So it gives me permission to say no to the rest, right? I'm going to have a guardrail 
of where I don't need to apply myself. I don't want to overextend where I'm at. Hen, uh, I'm sorry, not Henry Nouwen. Richard Swenson, in his book, has this line, and the book is called Margin. Variety is the spice of life and the kiss of death. The world has offered you a absolute buffet of things that you can choose from, right? The, the world has this buffet on display. Social media, the TV, the people around us. And it will stir things in our heart. Things that like, if I just had this job, this house, this marriage, these perfect kids, and then I begin to pursue that, it will be the kiss of death. I will find myself stressed out, wigged out, overextended. There's nothing wrong with having those things. There's nothing wrong with pursuing those things. Pursue those things out of your giftings. Pursue those things out of a love for Jesus. I'm going to pursue a nice house. I'm going to pursue a home that, you know what, when I have it, I'm going to have a place that we can invite people in and reflect Jesus back to them. I'm going to have a business that when I walk through those doors, I am impacting the people and the employees that are sitting there. But not only that, I want to impact them in such a way that when they leave that building, they impact others. And it's no longer about if God blesses that and, and it makes money, wonderful. But now we have resources to use to grow it to do more kingdom work. Can you define why you do the things that you do? So we see Jesus do two things. He slows his pace. Even at, so there's nothing wrong with having a really full day. Have a full day. Have a full week. But find space to hit pause, to slow all of that down, to go be with the Father. And then if you can start to look at what are the things that energize me? What are the things that give me, stir a passion in me? It's probably pretty close to your purpose in life, your why. And out of that, go. Put yourself in situations. Put yourself in places that you can spread the gospel. Brennan's going to come up here with the team in a few minutes. You guys' sign back there really intrigues me. Love God, love people. We've heard that. Impact the world. Here's my challenge for you this morning. As you're sitting here and, and you're thinking about your pace, you're thinking about the, the things that you have going on, that, well, there's people coming over for lunch and then we've got to get the house back cleaned up because Sunday night we're going to have a baseball game, we're going over somewhere because Monday there's people coming over and I won't have time and they get all this stuff like rolling around in your brain that I got to do. The Sunday scaries begin to set in about four o'clock because Monday morning is coming. Here's my challenge for you. When people come in contact with you, do they, do, does it strike a curiosity because they came in contact with you? Why do you seem at peace? Why do you seem calmer under stress? This world will have troubles. Jesus promises that. They hated him first, so they're going to hate us. This world's going to have issues. I don't downplay that. But when people come in contact with you, does it clarify the gospel to them? When you walk out of here and impact the world, has your pace slowed down to spend time with the Father can you articulate your why? And it's like when I bump into somebody that can do that, they'll say no to things that they don't need to be a part of. They won't say no to everything. They won't say yes to everything. But they'll say yes to the right things. And it clarifies the gospel to the world around us, to the world that we rub shoulders with. And when you begin to do some of those things, it'll shift us from being driven, just going down the rapids of life, to this place where we feel like we're driving. We feel like we're in control. So two things. If we can learn to articulate our why. Why do we do the things that we do? 
It'll give us permission to say no to the things that we don't need to be a part of, and it will slow our pace. If we're a disciple of Jesus, Jesus practices this discipline, this discipline of slowing. Help us to slow down, spend time with the Father, and out of that, you'll impact the world. Would you stand with me and we'll pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for just this morning. Help us to align our hearts with yours. Help us not to put our will over yours. That our, our will would be submitted to the authority of yours. And out of that, we could slow our pace. We could find out why we, need, why we do the things that we do. Help us discover our, our spiritual giftings and natural talents and how they can be used to impact the world around us. Help us to set our heart on you as we end here today in worship. And just slow down to be in your presence. In your name we pray. Amen.